how good it is to remember the array of life's cares, to hold our stories and our circumstances amidst those of others, and to be called back to a larger perspective, to know once again that in our trials and fears, our errors and our blessings, we are not alone. <clears throat> Let us together join in the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life and love, gracious God, Allah Adonai, ancient calm, voice of conscience and justice, mysterious abundance, beheld in the budding green of this week, the flowering tree, the lazy circles of a hawk in the sky, in the shouts of children at play, in the cries for justice in the street and the state house, and in that still small voice within us. We give thanks for beauties and delights of the week past, for the tenacity of life and spirit, for reminders of love and expressions of care given us. Remembering these turn us to gratitude. In prayer, we also take stock. When did we fall out of alignment with love and wisdom this week? We spoke harshly of others. We gave ourselves to impatience. We looked only to have our opinions and preferences confirmed. We practiced arrogance more than opening. We fell silent and looked away when our speaking and acting would have made a difference. Call us back to ways that enlarge the presence of love in this world. To lead not with certainty, but with curiosity. And to see the behaviors and choices of others, not in the shadow of judgment, but in the light of love. We pray this day for the grieving, those who enter this new season of spring without that special loved one. We pray for those living with a, with a fresh diagnosis, COVID, cancer, and more and for those making their way through treatment, recovery of all kinds. May they and all of us know moments of respite from cares and worries, fears and doubts. This week, we followed a trial and we pray for all those who live with both trauma from and threat of police. We pray for all those who break ranks to speak out and for all bystanders who carry a special burden. This week we demonstrated with Asian Americans and with transgender neighbors. And we pray for all those targeted by fear and hate. This week, we heard of people desperately crossing our borders, and we pray for the well being of all undocumented, all sojourners seeking safety and well being for themselves and their children. And we pray for those in dangerous lands especially Myanmar, where truth is courageously being spoken to overweening power. 
And now let the words stop and a quiet come. In the silence of shared prayer, we let the spirit lead us. We let a knowing, a leading set within us. Together we sit in two minutes of silent prayer, which begin and end with the sound of a chime. Welcome to all. I'm Nina Duncan, president of the Women's Alliance of First Parish, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today. I would like to offer a special welcome to our speaker, Marta Pearson. The Women's Alliance of First Parish is the women's organization in our church with a mission to support the women in our congregation and through that support to advance the interests and efforts of our entire church. It is a fellowship and a service organization, and we offer programs and sponsor the annual Alliance Sunday worship service. Through our member curated giving plan, we provide financial support to First Parish and nonprofits that provide services to women and families through difficult transitions. These gifts are possible because the Alliance has its own trust fund from gifts given by women of First Parish since the 1800s. Formal membership in the Alliance is open only to women, but Alliance activities are open to all, regardless of gender and age. We, we encourage all women in our First Parish to join us Information for membership is on our web pages on the First Parish website, and the link is here in the chat. Let me say a word about the Clara Barton Sisterhood and why these women are being honored. Universalist Clara Barton, one of our most famous foremothers, was a distinguished leader of her day, noted for organizing nursing services and supplies for soldiers during the Civil War. She was also a founder of the American Red Cross, 
and was actively involved in that organization until she was well into her 80s. To both honor her example and celebrate today's women, the UU Women's Federation created and maintains the Clara Barton Sisterhood to honor a UU woman for long-term service, having attained her 80th birthday. The Women's Alliance of First Parish is honored to present the award to honorees. Debbie Lewis postponed from 2020 in the days when I thought maybe we'd be together in the sanctuary celebrating. And Natalie Tyler and Gwen Hooper. Please note, we will have, because we're online, we'll have a moment for congratulations for all three honorees at the end. Deborah Noyes Lewis. Born on May 11th, 1939, Debbie Noyes Lewis has been a member of the community of Arlington for many years and raised her family here with her husband and poet, Philip Lewis. Debbie has contributed to Arlington community in many meaningful ways. She was an advocate for affordable housing as a member of the Housing Corporation of Arlington for 11 years, serving as its president for three. For several years, she has participated in demonstrations for mothers and grandmothers out front. At First Parish, she has taught religious education and participated in the Women's Book Club. She has been an exhi exhibition organizer and a contributing member of the Art Wall Committee. And at the Arlington Center for the Arts, she has created impressive works in different media. Currently, she enjoys a life with her family, filled with creativity, traveling, skiing, and activities at their vacation home in Maine. Thank you, Debbie. Natalie Tyler. Natalie Tyler was a native of Philadelphia and lived there with her family that has now grown to include four grandchildren. She majored in science in college and worked in teaching, social work, and nursing toward her nursing degree. For many years, she pursued her career as an inpatient mental health nurse. In the years since Natalie moved to Arlington and joined our church, she has used her many talents to the advantage of many. She has served as a lay minister, managed the summer maintenance of our gardens, provided hospitality at our alliance gatherings, served as an usher during services and participated in blood drives and as a volunteer of the UU Urban Ministry. Recently, she's been participating in the singing and yoga groups through Zoom at the Arlington Senior Center. Thank you, Natalie. Gwyneth Hooper. Gwyneth has been active in the town of Arlington and our first parish church for decades and is one of the best known and most loved people in our community. An article about her contributions was published online in yourarlington.com in 2014. Since she first made her entrance into the world, famously born in the elevator of a hospital in Philadelphia, she has made her own way independently. In 1970, she first approached the town selectmen about opening a daycare center for the children of working parents. She encountered much resistance and disapproval toward working women. Undeterred, she persisted for several months and the idea was finally approved. She opened her daycare center soon after. When she retired in 2004, to, uh, 
2004. The Arlington Children's Center served 163 toddlers. The preschool had a fully accredited kindergarten program and an after-school program for 55 students in grades one through five. It still flourishes today. She also contributed to the community again in 1980 when her own family, when her husband came out as gay, followed not long after by her son. And with two gay family members, Gwen bonded with others in Arlington, with gay loved ones and supported them, leading the way for the organization PFLAG, Parents, Family, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Currently, she lives nearby close to family and friends, and continues to be an active member of our congregation. Thank you, Gwen. At this time, I encourage you all to switch to gallery view so that we can watch to congratulate Debbie, Natalie, and Gwen. Good morning. I am Andrea Winslow, a member of the Alliance here at First Parish. Last year, Wendy Page from our congregation attended General Assembly and came back describing an award-winning sermon that she had heard given by someone named Marta Pearson. Wendy asked, could we have her come to First Parish? Maybe the Alliance would be interested in inviting her. As one of the Alliance program chairs, I grabbed my laptop and I took out Google and said, who is Marta Pearson? I found out that she has over 40 years of work experience wearing a few different hats. She has worked as a trauma recovery therapist and teacher. She spent over 20 years as a life coach. And Marta continues to give powerful interactive workshops focusing on personal and communal empowerment. As a Unitarian Universalist, she also wears the hat of a designated UU speaker. After contacting Marta, I was impressed with how she wanted to experience our congregation. She asked for the link to our recorded worship gatherings. Two weeks ago, she attended our Sunday service to get a personal feel for us, the congregation she was going to be preaching to. And she wanted an opportunity to meet us. She was curious about what our response to her sermon might be. Consequently, after the service today, we will have a 10 minute social time followed by a 20 minute reverberation session with Marta. We hope that many of you can join us. First Parish Arlington is so pleased that you could be with us. Welcome Marta. Thank you very much. Andrea, it's been really a pleasure working with you. It's not a card, it's a whole deck, how racism harms us all. In 2009 in Washington state, my friend Michael Kassenbaum and I would occasionally gather to watch an interesting television program. Before the program, we usually had time to talk. Now, that meant usually I talked and he listened. Hey, it's me. And if you'd had any experience with me, you know that I like to talk. Mm -hmm. And Michael is an extremely good listener, as I know that you will prove to be also. On this evening, we explored a situation that was being discussed on the news. I'm not sure about the details any longer. It May have been that a black youth had been shot. Now, this was long before Trayvon Martin 
or it may have been something less violent, but no less volatile. Regardless of the details, when a citizen who was black raised race as an issue, a Caucasian responded with the question, why do they always, and yes, he said they, always play the race card? Michael, an open-minded liberal, asked me, why don't they get it? How can they not see that it's about race? And we were off, or at least I was, and running. It was this conversation that first pinged in my brain, but it was only a title then. Yet I knew it was one I wanted to write and deliver. However, I put it off for a long time because I wasn't sure that I could come up with 52 cards. Sad to say, when I began my list, I had no problem finding 52 distinct issues, many directly related to my life plus two jokers. 12 cards in each, 13 cards in each suit. I'll recite them going into detail, detail only about a few of fewer than a dozen. This sermon was first presented in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. and his dream. That was then, this is now. I want more than a dream once a year. I want his distant dreams and our present dreams honored every day. I want a reality check on the disasters that are now unfolding on a regular basis that are destroying dreams and lives. Clubs, history to present, hurt and harm. Number one, slavery. Number two, whips. Number three, Jim Crow. Now, I went into a flea market one day, secondhand store, and I saw this statuette, the Jim Crow, on a shelf. I can't begin to tell you how visceral that reaction was when I looked at it. All I could think was of all of the no colors allowed signs or whites only signs. I wanted to take it, buy it and smash it, but I couldn't bring myself to do anything more than to take a picture of it to use in an appropriate manner. Number four was segregation. Number five is was voting denied, but I can't say was anymore because all we have to do is look at Georgia and realize that the Jim Crow era is alive and well. There were poll tax, there was literacy and voting tests, there was education denied, there's the school to prison pipeline that is actively working to condemn our black youth. There is then the prisoner, the felon, the ex-con. There is disenfranchisement. Even in my now state of Florida, when the people said, let us give people who are returning to our society from prisons the right to vote, the legislature found a loophole to prevent it from happening. Disenfranchisement is not a past issue, it is an ongoing issue. Unemployability, because once you have a record, it is hard to get a job, it is hard to get housing. And the 13th card in the club's suite is revitalized KKK, the Proud Boys, other white supremacy groups, and the Confederate flags flying high in Congress on January 6, 2021. 2021. Let's move on to the spades. The names that we have been called, sticks and stones and bullets and knees. 
Number one, Jungle Buddy, Jigaboo, Nigger, Mulatto, Colored, Negro, and finally Black. Black is the first title for ourselves that we chose ourselves. And African American, the current preference by many people. I can remember back in the 60s when we, my generation, chose Black as what we want it to be called. And I can remember my grandmother feeling very, very uncomfortable with that. She was used to colored and Negro. I now have more empathy for her because it is hard for me to transition from Black to African-American, but I'm working at it and I use them interchangeably. I look at the martyrs and the plain folk who have died for this cause of equality and justice. I think of the young men and women who will never get the opportunity to grow old. I look at the good police not standing up to those police officers who are not good. I look at the shots in the back and the failure to convict those who do it. And I look at Martin Luther King Jr.'s dreams versus our stark and ugly reality. Moving on to the hearts, I look at childhood and parenting pain. I remember my grandfather, David, when I was in my 30s talking with me about the time when I was a toddler that he could not take me into an amusement park as I cried at the entrance wanting to go in and ride the carousel. The grown man, more than 30 years later, crying tears because of his failure to be the grandfather he wanted to be. I think of forbidden kisses because when I was in the fourth grade, I was bused to another school, not because of racial issues, but because my elementary school was overcrowded and another in another part of town, a white part of town, was under staff, uh, under uh, represented with children. They had extra classrooms. I can remember going onto the playground one day and there was a little white boy from another class who would play with me. And one day he reached to kiss me and I reacted in horror. Even at that age, I knew it would be wrong. And I told him so. He didn't understand. I'm sure eventually he did. I also think of Tim Mishaw, a person I went to high school with. A few years ago, I traveled up to Canada where he now lives and had a wonderful weekend with his wife and him as I traveled to the West. I told him that I had had a crush on him and he told me he'd had a crush on me too. This was long before interracial dating was even a hint on the horizon. And that's a kiss that I'm sorry I never got to experience. I think of my daughter Nancy as my third card in hearts and how in second grade her teacher called me in for a conference after about three weeks of school telling me that she didn't think my daughter was going to pass second grade. I do not draw the race card. I try very hard not to draw the race card. And I looked for other reasons why this teacher might be saying this to me so soon. My best friend, who is a psychologist and white said what she saw was that this teacher saw my daughter as a poor little color girl who just couldn't get it. I think about my daughter later as the the uh, fourth card when I taught her that you do not go shopping without looking good. You do not wear sloppy clothes. You do not wear clothes that are tattered. And you never 
ever put your hands in your pocket or open your purse until you are there ready to pay for your purchase because we are watched in a way that Caucasians are not. I think of my son as the fifth card in, the de in this suit and how I taught him that when you begin to drive, you will put your hands on the wheel if you are ever stopped. You will do whatever they say. You will be polite. You will control your tone of voice. Even if they are in the wrong and you are in the right because I want you home alive, no matter what it takes for that to happen. I think of hard work that I put in that was unrewarded. For number uh, seven, I think of my experience when I began junior high school, and yes, this is another story about me, I learned that an eighth grade girl and boy would receive the American Legion Award for Citizenship. It was the highest, most coveted honor presented by my school. The two winners would be selected by the teachers based on their two years of scholastic record and civic participation. I wanted that award and I was determined to get it. A week before the award ceremony, before graduation, my teacher advisor came to me and said, I would be getting the award. She also told me though that a boy, white, and a girl, white, would also be receiving the award. She explained that the teachers had submitted only my name as the girl, but the American Legion refused to award it to a colored girl and asked the teachers to withdraw my name. They refused. So a compromise was reached. For the first time in the history of the school, and the last, to my knowledge, three people received the American Legion Award that year. John walked across the stage to receive his. A white girl walked across the stage to receive hers. And I walked across the stage to receive mine. This was 58 years ago. And as I talk about it, the pain is just as real and just as strong in my heart today as it was that night. Back to the other hearts, I think of the jobs that I was denied and the promotions that I did not get. I think of the higher insurance I paid because I lived in a red lined area. Do you know where red lining came from? It happened around World War II when all of the veterans were coming back and money was being pumped into the system for new housing outside of the city areas. And the realtors and the government officials would use a red marker to draw lines that indicate where colored people could not live or get mortgages. I think about the loans that I was denied when I attempted to get my first house. I think about my daughter's adoption that was delayed because the white social worker just didn't feel that I qualified, even though I was a master's degree, I was a professional woman and had been a foster parent for the system for eight years. I think of the fact that there is no blending. When I have heard people say, well, the Irish did it and the Germans did it and everyone else has done it, why don't you? Well, we have kinky hair, we have dark skin, we have flat noses. There is no way to blend in. 
let me go where there's some shiny things, diamonds, sometimes in the rough and sometimes shiny. I think number one, first of all, the card is my 10 black grandchildren. The second one is my one biracial black white grandchild. The third is my one black Native American Russian heritage grandchild. Now that's a combination. I think of my three white grandchildren. That's a total of 15 grandchildren. Now I can't really take credit for it because I didn't give birth to them, but I claimed them and love them all. I look at my six great grandchildren, one black, one white, and three biracial. I think of my wonderful white daughter-in-law who I love sincerely, who has made my son extremely happy. I think of my fantastic white son-in-law who is one of the most wonderful men I know, taking care of his sons and my daughter and serving in the Navy of our country. I think of my Italian American best friend forever, Pam. I think of my accepting church. And I think of all of the inventions by blacks, too numerous to list, including the development of blood transfers by Dr. Jar Charles Drew during World War II. And the irony is blacks were not allowed to donate blood, even though a black created the process. My final three diamonds, my current rays of hope, two black women and a white male, Stacey Abrams, Kamala Harris, and Joseph Biden. In 2015, I sat in the teacher's lounge at the school where I was substitute teaching. At a nearby table, people talked about the burning and riots that had occurred the previous night in Ferguson, Missouri. A white male in his late 40s told of his experience in high school when students wanted a clothing change. They petitioned the principal who said no. They went to the superintendent who said no. Then to the school board, which also said no. The entire student body, Caucasian, sat in the front of the school refusing to return to class. They ultimately got their change. I sat and tried to convince myself that it would be useless to say anything. Those who know me know that it is seldom, if ever, that I don't speak up. And this was no exception. I decided it was my responsibility to provide a teaching moment. I asked what they would have done if they hadn't been granted the change they sought that time after time they had been turned down and ultimately did not win. I could tell by the look on his face that he had trouble imagining that ever happening. It just couldn't occur to him. I asked them to consider that blacks have asked and asked and asked to no avail and the frustration it leads to causes some to riot and burn. Not right, but understandable. I told them about my American Legion experience as I told you earlier, and I think some at that table got it. I urge each of you to find and use teachable moments. It's not about whether they all agree or get it. It's about taking the opportunity to do. If we are successful one out of five times or one out of 10, it's better than zero out of zero because we didn't even do that one thing. 
How does racism harm us all? I can only think of the inventions that have not been created because Blacks have been denied an education or the opportunity. I can only think of the medicines that haven't been created or the treatments that haven't been, been thought of because of the lack of opportunity. I think of all of the things we may be missing because that one black child was denied the opportunity to advance. Where would we be if we had all had the opportunities to contribute to our society? Well, we can't leave out the jokers. The first joker is a failure to educate. And I have to admit that I am sometimes have been in the past guilty of this. I have not always shared my stories with my children, maybe because I didn't want to look flawed in their eyes or I didn't want to see the pity or the sadness that my stories might create in them. I'm correcting that. I am talking more to my children about my history, about my family's history, about their younger lives and how we need to go forward and share that information with others. If you have not shared the information you hear from your black friends, start doing that. It's the only way I believe that thing, change will actually happen. And I wanted to provide you with information, data, points that you can use to point out to people when you are confronted by racism. Do not be silent because silence makes you appear to consent and agree. One of the teaching techniques I use communication wise is to say, less rather than more. When you hear something that disturbs you, ask them, why do you say that? And when they say, well, you know, you simply respond with, no, I don't. Tell me. Put the pressure on them to respond instead of you responding first. The last joker is voter apathy. We're working on that one. We've done really well this past year. We elected Joe Biden. We elected two black senators from Georgia. And just think of how disturbing that was to the whites in, in their House of Representatives and their Senate. They have enacted laws to prevent us from moving forward. And Texas is on the verge of doing the same thing. If you have not talked to your adult children, please do so. If you have not talked to your adult grandchildren, please do so. Talk to your neighbors, talk to each other, get the vote out, and we can't wait until just before the election. We need to start now for 2022. And don't just look at the national elections. The local elections are just as important in your city, in your county, and definitely in your state. The state legislatures have so much power to harm people. Get active, get involved, Take a break when you need to, but please, please make this a priority and a consistent behavior on your part. Anne Frank, since high school, I have been impressed by the words of a teenager written before I was born and I use them often to close. Quote, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world." Close quote. Anne Frank. Teachable moments frequently provide themselves. Look for them. Those are your moments. Act upon them. 
I thank you for listening to me today.